Rick started his uh, professional career, uh, if I have this right, as a social science teacher in high school. Social studies. Social studies. Uh, then uh, Rick went to work for the American Cancer Society for about 20 years and became uh, an executive vice president of the Oregon chapter. Uh, rather than reading through all of this, I think you have this information. Uh, I would like to point out that Rick has spent a lot of his life and a lot of his moments as a volunteer for various causes, uh, including conceiving and developing and introducing faith-based programs to educate us all about sustainable agricultural practices. And the title of Rick's presentation this evening is One Unitarian's Look at Genetic Engineering. How are you? Thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here. and I, I love coming to Ashland, so uh, this was a great opportunity. So Katie, thank you very much for giving me that. Uh, you notice Ray asked for like a one-liner, um, and I said, you know, one Unitarian's look, because one Unitarian really never knows what another Unitarian is thinking, so this is just for me. If you're a Unitarian out there, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, just, uh, I'm going to be taking, this has been fascinating, just listening to Jesse and Rob, my gosh, the mind is completely different, uh, so we're getting quite a, uh, smorgasbord here of perspectives on this, uh, although we all sh certainly share concerns with the uh, genetically engineered uh, foods. Um, if anybody, just a real quick introduction on Unitarians. Uh, we're different in that we don't have a specific creed or doctrine that everybody has to tie into. We are, uh, some people believe in God, some people are atheists, some people are somewhere in the middle. Uh, all very different, but we all share one thing, and it's, it's called the uh, seven principles. And these are just more like guidelines or goals that we try to live up to and adhere to. So I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'll just give you a couple. Like the first one is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Uh, another is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. So these are the kind of things that kind of tie us all together, and we just come at, we just, it's a search for truth uh, in a lot of different directions. One is the environmental one, it's respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we're all a part, and uh, that's been alluded to already. Uh, we're all in this together. Everything is interconnected, and we've talked quite a bit about the uh, environmental problems, so I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to take a very different approach tonight and concentrate on one principle out of the seven, and here it is. Like most Unitarians, I have not memorized the seven principles, so uh, I have them right here in front of me. A free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Uh, I've been working on this field for about 10 years. I worked for Physicians for Social Responsibility as the director of the Campaign for Safe Food Program. I'm not a doctor or a scientist. Uh, I just work with all of them throughout most of my life. Uh, and this is what struck me, is how, what I used to think of science as these kind of on a pedestal, scientists, unbiased, uh, this free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And what I found in the, in the ways of GMOs was very, very different. So I just want to talk about that. And talk about scientists. I'm not going to get any deep scientists because I'm not one, or science, I'm not a scientist, and that's, that's Ray's job, so you can, uh, <laughs> as an EPA uh, scientist, but here's what I found. And you're in Jackson County, and you are way beyond what most people in the country, in terms of knowledge, I think, of uh, genetically engineered foods, uh, just because of what you've been through and what you've accomplished here, which is nationwide. People know Jackson County, Oregon. It's too that good. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Um, so you may already know this, but just not. Let's just run through this real quick. You know, we got this. Oh, there's a consensus that GMOs are safe. Well, and now the FDA says so. Well, here's what we know. If you look underneath that soundbite, the FDA doesn't do any safety testing. The FDA doesn't require any independent testing. 
The only safety testing is done by the very same corporations that are producing the genetically engineered foods. And when I, I've been speaking to a lot of audiences, I've been in a lot of debates over the past month, and uh, a lot of people, most people don't know this or don't realize it. And I, I tell them this quote, which is right from the FDA, quote, ultimately, it is the food producer who is responsible for assuring safety. In other words, the, the United States regulatory system is set up so that Monsanto and Syngenta and Dow Chemical are ultimately responsible for our food safety. Now, if that isn't a red flag, I don't know what is. Uh, I mean, if that isn't a definition of conflict of interest, I don't know what is. Um, if that isn't the fox in charge of the hen house, I don't know what is. That's, that's our system. Also, these safety tests are not even required. Unlike any other developed country in the world, we don't have mandatory safety testing pre-market for genetically engineered foods. And no long-term tests are, are required. No long-term tests anywhere. This is the state that we're in. I don't think you have to be a scientist or a doctor or anybody to see. Isn't this, you know, from a Unitarian perspective, is this a free and responsible search for truth and meaning? I don't think so. I, I, I brought in one example here um, to get back to independent testing. A couple of years ago, 26 corn scientists wrote a complaint letter to the EPA. You may have got, I don't know if you were still working for the EPA then or not, but they were saying, um, and I'm just going to read it because I want to take their words and not my interpretation of their words. This is from a New York Times article on this. Um, the researchers, 26 corn insect specialists, withheld their names because they feared being cut off from research by the companies. They were complaining because they couldn't do any independent research because everything had to go through the companies. And uh, just a couple of others, because this is very revealing. Here's one that did dare use his name. Quote, people are afraid of being blacklisted. If your sole job is to work on corn insects and you need the latest corn varieties, and the companies decide not to give it to you, you can't do your job. Okay, this isn't free. This, they're talking about losing their jobs if they dare find out anything, if they dare go against this prevailing mantra, false mantra, that it's all safe. It's all safe. And then one quotes, one scientist said, no truly independent research can be legally conducted on many critical questions. This is the state of science that we have. Um, I want to go back to long-term tests. Um, this is, I'm not going to get in the weeds, one, I'm not a scientist, but two, I don't want your eyes to glaze over, but everybody can understand this. The vast majority, virtually all the tests being pr performed, safety tests, on mice or rats, are 90 days. That's it, 90 days. This is not long-term. This is not an equivalent of a human lifetime. And when one scientist, uh, there have only been about five or six that I could find. If you want a great website, if you don't know it already, gmwatch.org. Because then you can take every sound bite they use and go right underneath. It is a magnificent website, gmwatch.org. It's out of the UK. And they, they took a look at these. There have been about a half a dozen long-term studies. In other words, more than 90 days. And what did they find? The latest one, quite a controversial case. You know this one. Cyril Laney, professor from France. He took a Roundup-ready corn. And he, and he saw what Monsanto had produced in their 90 days. He said, this looks, Monsanto said it was fine. So that's it. And he looked at the raw data. He said, oh, I'm not so sure. I want to take it out to two years, more the equivalent of the human lifespan. And what did he find? He found kidney damage, he found liver damage, they found tumors, they found premature death. That's what they found. And he found this not only with the corn itself, but he also found it just with Roundup and with both of them together. 
And this was not the only Elantro study. Like I said, there haven't been that many. But this is not the only one that was finding all these problems. Now you would think that, isn't this, it may not be fire, but it sure looks like smoke to me. Doesn't this need to be repeated? Like that? And instead, just like so many scientists, the ones that have had the courage to speak out, or he's one of them, they will get attacked. Attacked. You know, way beyond the measure of normal scientific discourse and civil, you know, disagreements. Uh, and this, this has been going back and forth. The paper that produced it retracted it. It was printed in another paper. But I can tell you this, the European Union thought of like this, that they said, we're going to do a lot. We're going to try to repeat this. We're going to devote three million euros to do it. So maybe, just maybe, we can build on this. But this is the kind of thing that goes on. Um, just a few words. So I want to get to the questions, too. That's, that's fun. Um, another hat that I wear is I'm on the steering committee of Measure 92 to label GMOs. Uh, and it's, it's funny because Jesse was quoting from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so I, I was reading in our, uh, we get these media clips. So I was reading this today and I thought, here's this editorial from the Wall Street Journal. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. Um, and it was. So I got a quote from the Wall Street Journal here, uh, editorial. And those of you working on Measure 92, I hope you all are. If you're not, I hope you do in a few days left. Quote, the labeling initiative would require farmers who sell crops in Oregon to implement entirely new inventory procedures with cost inefficiencies um, rippling across the supply chain to manufacturers and retailers. All of these extra costs for farmers. You may have seen the woman wheat farmer on TV saying, this is not the worst thing I've ever seen. Millions of dollars of cost to farmers. And I talked to a lot of people, I said, my God, what are you doing to farmers? Yeah, I want to know what's in my food, but I don't want to hurt farmers. Okay, just, just in case you're wondering. 220 agricultural products in Oregon. Four of them out of the 220 are genetically engineered. The vast majority of farmers have nothing to do with genetic engineering, wouldn't be affected by Measure 92 at all. And for those few that do grow genetically engineered crops, if they're sending to a processor, and we're just talking two products, basically sugar beets and alfalfa. They're sending to a processor, what do they have to do? They have to tell that processor, our crops are genetically engineered. As if they don't already know, but they just have to tell them, this costs nothing. If they're selling directly to a retailer, a grocery store, there are only two products basically here, some sweet corn and some summer squash. All they have to do is put on their containers, whether it's a crate or a bag or whatever, genetically engineered. That's it. There are no more costs. That's it. And then millions of dollars. And by the way, the lady wheat farmer on the television commercial, there is no wheat that has been gen uh, approved for commercial sale that's genetically engineered. There are no genetically engineered wheat farmers because genetically engineered wheat doesn't even exist. This is the kind of thing they're doing. This is the kind of false information. This is about as far away from, quote, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning as you can get. Um, I want to finish by saying, uh, this is kind of about seeds, and I want to think of truth in terms of seeds, too, because truth can take a battery. Um, Obviously it has in all the science, and all the scientific research, and lack thereof when it comes to GMOs. And it really takes a bad man in a political campaign. I and mean, we've all seen that, if you've been seeing the TV commercials and hearing the radio ads and getting the direct mail. Um, it almost seems like there's a concrete laid down over the ground to try to suppress the truth from coming out. And if you're an activist, and I think a lot of you are, 
you know, this, this is pretty tough sometimes. It can get a little discouraging. They think, oh my God, we're trying to do what we think is good, and all these companies, millions and millions and millions of dollars poured in against this. Um, but you know what? Every, every sidewalk, every concrete sidewalk I've seen has cracks. And up through those cracks can grow grass. And those, that grass is coming from the seed. And I look at this like, these are the seeds of truth. And I don't care how much concrete they lay down. It's going to crack. And every one of us can be a blade of grass pushing out through it and turning that concrete into dust. And that's what we're all about. And now you've already taken a giant step forward in Jackson County. Okay? Measure 92 would be a major, major second step. This is also being washed around the country. So I can just speak from both my Unitarian hat and my Measure 92 hat. Um, we got about one week left. Anything you can do. Uh, to make this happen, to get, to help us get the truth, to just allow people to know what's in their food. We have that right. Please do it. And thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, Katie, do you have some questions for us? Question for Rick. Did the Oregon Ecumenical Council of Churches decide to endorse yes on Measure 92? And what churches did that decision include? No. Uh, Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon includes, uh, I believe, all the major faith groups, whether they're uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim. And they, uh, they looked at this and they enthusiastically endorsed it. And I bring this up in debates because the other side is very fond of saying that, oh my God, this is going to increase food costs for consumers. And, and then the, the, the angle they'll use is, look what you're doing to poor people you know, who cannot afford to have, to pay more for their, you know, how could you be so cruel as to do this? My response is, you know what? Every one of these major religions has as a basic tenet that they take care of poor and low income and disadvantaged people. Do you think for one minute that they would endorse Measure 92 if they really felt that this was going to increase food prices? No, of course not. There wasn't, there wasn't a single religious organization that came out against Measure 92. No. no. At what point does labeling become nationwide as opposed to state by state? And uh, how is this an economic issue for the food industry? What a lot of people don't know is there, has been, there have been bills introduced in Congress for about a dozen the last 12 years trying to do just that with mandatory GMO labeling. The very same corporations, the food corporations, the Pepsi's and the Cokes and the General Mills and Monsanto and, and all them that have come out with a soundbite like, oh, this shouldn't be done state by state. They are the same ones that have stopped it at the federal level by working with friendly legislators uh, <laughs> in Congress. Uh, it, it's hard to say for sure. I did have a little conversation with Earl Blumenauer. He's a representative uh, congressman from Portland at a fundraising event a couple weeks ago. I said, if Oregon passes, what do you think of the chances? He said, well, I don't think in the next two years, but maybe, you know, but maybe after that, it depends. There are 24 other states that have introduced legislation to label GMOs. If, if it just gets started, I, I think Oregon can be a real turning point. We can be a real um, beacon of hope for other states, because Vermont went first, bless their hearts, through their legislature. Um, and Connecticut and Maine have passed legislation, but they have to wait for other states for it to go into effect. So we'd really be the second. If it starts happening, and they just build such a movement, uh, this is how a lot of laws get passed at the federal level. The states are the laboratories. 
and there becomes so much pressure from the states. For all you women here, um, you would not have had the right to vote, most likely, if the states had not taken the lead in getting women, women's suffrage in states first before the federal government could no longer ignore it. So that's, that's how I see that. Is that? So, was there an economic aspect oh, oh. to that question? Uh, yeah, so let me just let me uh, Yes. Uh, what do you basically, I, I, I'm reading between the lines, what do you think would be the economic uh, impact on the food industry? Like, well, if I could clarify it with my question. Yeah. Like, like uh, if Oregon passes, then are they going to just label food just, just for Oregon? What if, I mean, if they're going to sell in neighboring states, why? Why wouldn't they just label it as well there as well, rather than changing the label to just for it? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, uh, I don't think anybody knows the exact answer to that, and I think it may vary from company to company and product to product. Uh, they are very afraid of labeling because there are three basic things that can happen. I, I saw this latest uh, survey in the Food Navigator. People looking at labels, 52% of the people don't even look at labels. So they're not, this wouldn't, so that leaves those that do and of those that do, some of them are going to look and see produced with genetic engineering, and they're going to say, well, so I don't, I don't really care that much. Uh, others are going to look at that and say, you know, I don't really like this, and I'm going to try to find a comparable product that does not have this label on. It is that segment of consumers that they are scared to death of. Uh, and if you're in a business situation, even if you lose like 5%, it may not seem like a whole lot to us, but you know, it could be huge to them. So I I don't know, I mean, I can't say exactly what they do. They may just label, I mean, they're already labeling for 64 other countries, and if they export to them, they have separate labels. So just putting those four words on a label costs virtually nothing. Uh, it is the, okay, they're going to have to, whatever regional warehouse they have, you know, just go to Oregon or go to Vermont or other states as they start. Uh, but I don't know, uh, you know, what they're really afraid of is that this will then ripple down into the food production chain that more and more people don't want GMO sugar eats, sugar or corn syrup, and then the farmers, what farmers have done for hundreds of years, I mean, you guys they are closer to that than I am. They're going to grow what consumers and If they don't want GMOs, guess what? There goes Monsanto's bottom line, and that's what they're afraid of. Is this your brochure? Uh, yes. <laughs> I want to read the other part of your brochure. I love this when I got it in the mail. It's the most informative uh, Rick's brochure with the beautiful... Not mine. I can't take credit well, for it. It's our, our campaign. It's your yeah. campaign. Here, in terms of labeling for other things. This is Dr. Michael Hansen from Senior Scientist Consumers Union. Labeling will not increase food prices. Food companies change labels all the time without labeling prices. That never occurred to me. They're labeling, relabeling. This is happening all the time, whether it's one state, the neighboring state, they don't care. They can do this. It's, it's not a big deal. Uh, boy, there's so many interesting questions here. Um, Okay, let's try this one. Uh, it's directed towards Rick. How is the 92 camp, uh, Measure 92 campaign responding to all of the slick, expensive mailers that are being sent full of lies? I phone bank here, and I hear how many are being delivered. Uh, I'm assuming how, how many are being delivered into uh, other people's homes. Something to that effect. So how are people responding? Well, whoever wrote this question, you are how we're responding more than that. You and as many hundreds of other people that we can get that are making phone calls and going door to door. Um, it, it's coming down to our people against their money. I mean, we have a fair amount of money ourselves, but we can't match them. They're up, what, I don't know, maybe you've seen 17, 18 million now, something like that. We're probably around seven or eight million that we've raised, so there's no way that we have the deep pockets that they do. So for every two ads you're going to see of theirs on TV, you'll probably see one of ours. And we're hoping that just to hold that off and make sure that our message uh, gets sent. 
But at this stage of the game, with one week left, um, it is, it, it's people contact. It, it's, it's person to person, it's those phone calls, it's getting people to vote. We know a lot of people are on our side. But, so, well, especially younger people don't tend to vote at as high a rate as older people do, so especially contacting them. You gotta vote, you know, get that ballot in. And that's, this is our main uh, approach, is just people power. Uh, you know, it's gonna be close, so every vote counts. Uh, every, every vote. Uh, don't take any one for granted. I, we had my little tiny local community of Durham, Oregon. We had a, an initiative to uh, raise property taxes to save this growth of trees from being developed. We won that. The vote was 270 to 269. Oh. One vote. I know what one vote can do. Uh, so, um, believe me, uh, I'm thinking this one could be, I don't know if it's going to be that close, but uh, it's going to be close. Sorry, Rick, you're from Portland, but we don't know about numbers like that down here. <laughs> okay, here's a question that I have thought about a long time, and I think I know how to answer it now. So, Ray, where and how did you get the green corn seed? And isn't it intellectual property theft for you to have that? <laughs> I borrowed them, so it's not theft, from a friend of a friend whom I really don't know. And I intend at the end of the campaign to return those babies back to my friend who will give it then to his friend and presumably put it back into the Monsanto bag. <laughs> you wouldn't want to steal the sacred seed, would you? Uh, Okay, why aren't other countries testing GMOs and sharing their findings, basically I'll say, with the world? Our practices affect the whole world. And I, I'll take a crack at it. Um, uh, other scientists from around the world have done and published research. And Rick alluded to one of them earlier, uh, Professor Seralini, and shared with you what happened to him. Uh, uh, Stai in Scotland shared some information and he suffered a similar professional put down. Uh, uh, Carrasco uh, in Argentina, I believe he's recently passed away, uh, uh, published uh, and he was put down. Uh, so that's the way it's been going. There's been some very interesting powerful research. I never would have guessed, I don't know these scientists in Thailand at their national university, uh, in, in incriminating rather loudly uh, glyphosate itself as a hormone disruptor that is capable of causing extended multiplication certain lines of breast cell cancer, uh, cancer breast cell lines. Uh, and they, to the best of my knowledge, have not suffered any consequences and that kind of re <laughs> comes to support i mean i was impressed with their work and maybe the other side is too so it's going on and it's usually not happening in the united states and i think you all know why uh, our jobs as university professors in research setting uh, is to entice the best young minds we can to carry out thesis research and sooner or later, that student is going to finish up, want to publish a thesis, and try to get a job. But unfortunately, if that work uh, has stemmed from some type of research on this, uh, I will have had to sign an agreement with the agrochemical industry that says, Ray, when your student's work is done and it's written up, we get to review the manuscript before it goes out into the world. So if they don't like the results, and you know, you don't really do research if you know what the results are going to be in the end, that's not research. But so you don't know, and it turns out that it's incriminating work. The student's uh, thesis doesn't get published. His uh, advanced degree may be sacrificed, 
And certainly it will be extremely difficult for that person to get a job. Why didn't you publish? Um, so that's kind of where the world is on R&D, research and development in, in the field. Uh, good question here. I'm not an attorney, so I'm looking for some help here, guys. Is the food industry bonded or have liability insurance on, on delayed harms from consuming their, their products? Anybody care to address that? I don't, I don't know how that works. I, I don't know it. Well, I don't know the whole legal. Isn't that one of the ones that they don't want labeling? Because you can't track it, you can't Well, uh, actually, uh, I, I, in a way, I would disagree with Rick because of, of a specialty here. Uh, every genetically engineered organism is required to be absolutely and definitively uh, identified. That's a basic uh, requirement of all legislators. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, of the regulators. And EPA and USDA, and that's done by putting, if you will, kind of a stamp on the actual molecules of DNA that are put into uh, that organism. For example, in, in, in the work that that Center for Food Safety and uh, Our Family Farms Coalition did uh, to identify whether there's genetically engineered ingredients in baby food, uh, the company that we did get to work with. Uh, actually was able to identify, yes, not only is there something there, but which company it came from and which specific trait it represented. So those kinds of things are identified. What the trait is in the thing. Are they, but are they liable? I, yeah, I, I don't know how that works. It would be the same way as the uh, cigarettes. As, as tobacco. They're liable then. Yeah. Or, the lawyers are going to go after them regardless of whether they have a chance or not. They're going to yeah, go. Sure. When, when this gets clear, it's going to be gangbusters. Mm -hmm. That's worked, what's going to happen. I worked in the environmental claim department of an insurance company and uh, what happened there was called uh, dilution of liability. They tried to attribute the diseases to other factors than the GMO. So, if anything, a portion of the settlement or payment only is attributed to GMOs, and other portion is attributed to sunspots or you know, yeah. smoking. And um, they—that's how they try to like vary the liability. And a lot of times, if it's not provable, there's no settlement or payment. We are just beginning the work of undoing what has been done here. Um, so moratoriums, boycotts, antitrust, um, this is just a, the beginning of what needs to happen to reverse something that was really done behind closed doors unfairly to the American people. Um, and it's not natural. I don't think it can stand. Um, and I just really appreciate um, everybody being here and I also really appreciate that we're moving towards a place where we can speak beyond the science to the ethics, to the morality, to the bigger questions, the really underlying questions um, of where this planet is headed. And we as Americans, um, and we as Oregonians, I think, especially from the state of Jefferson, our region, have a lot of responsibility. We can take leadership and show some new ways, some better ways, some new, some old, but certainly not continue down this path unchallenged. Um, so I hope you will engage your own faith groups and churches in this conversation too because it, it's been, as I said, the Chamber of Commons, um, sort of the no fear nonprofit, you know, treading where angels fear to tread, um, you know, in a topic that's pretty controversial, but at the base of it, isn't this really about life and, and how glorious it really is and not to let that be stolen from us so I really want to thank all of you uh, dear friends so great um, and all the audience and I'll pass it back to our master of ceremonies Ray thank you <laughs>